I, uh, I guess I should just issue a blanket apology on behalf of the media. Does that seem like the right <laughs> in the individual healing category? Uh, it's a tough group to be part of these days for a lot of reasons, but um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first I'll quickly just talk about, you know, how the media interacts with all the things that we just heard. Um, but then I want to get to some of the things that, that are being done um, to try to disrupt that feedback loop that the media has us in. Um, you know, I think when you're at this level, as, Ash, as Samantha calls it, of toxic polarization, traditional journalism doesn't work. It actually has often the opposite effect of the intent, right? So um, all the biases become magnified, right? And we see it in, in the research that the more news Americans consume, the more distorted their views of the other side, right? So literally our, the thing we are creating, which is for most journalists designed to try to make you more informed is having the opposite effect. Um, so that's a sign that you're in a, a toxic level of polarization. Um, and you know, you know many of the reasons uh, already, so I won't dwell on those, but some of the reasons have to do with social media, with the attention economy. I mean, the, the business incentives of CNN are not different really from the business incentives of Facebook. There's just fewer algorithms and more sort of human judgment and principles involved. But, um, but those, those things are similar, right? Like the more kind of addled and anxious you are, the more profit you make for, for Facebook. So, um, so that's one problem is the business problem. Um, but the problem I wanna talk about, which I think is less commonly addressed um, is the problem, um, it sounds obvious, but we rarely talk about it, especially journalists. And that is that journalists themselves are captured by the conflict. You know, they're not exempt, right, from the polarization. It doesn't mean that they're sort of peddling fake news or making up stories or, you know, I mean, there, there are lots of biases, right? But, but you would expect for journalists themselves to be affected by the very same forces that we've been talking about. And I see that among myself and my colleagues. So we are in our own bubbles. We are uh, disproportionately affected by Twitter, for example. Um, I had a journalist say to me the other day that, you know, one of the things he fears most is being the subject of a tweet storm, right? Um, and so when you are literally consciously or subconsciously writing your stories out of fear that an extremist group, which is what is on Twitter for the most part, not all, not always, but we know it's not representative of average Americans in lots of ways. These are the most vocal activist people plus journalists <laughs> in this kind of round and round echo chamber. And when you're writing out of conscious or subconscious fear that you'll get attacked on Twitter, um, you're gonna change what you write, right? Um, so there's this, again, this, this diabolical feedback loop um, that that leads to lots of unintended consequences. And the, and the last one I wanna just mention here is um, there was a paper, um, an NBER paper that came out just the other day called Why is All COVID-19 News Bad News? And if you haven't seen it, I, I recommend it. Um, and uh, it basically analyzes news coverage of COVID starting in, I think it was like January to the summer. So over a pretty broad period of time and looks at um, using sort of supervised machine learning, looks at the sentiment of those articles. And what they found is that for major US media, so these are sort of the biggest outlets, Fox, CNN, New York Times, um, a mix of, of TV and print, 91% um, of the stories related to COVID were negative. And you might think, well, it was pretty bad. It is pretty bad. Maybe they should be negative, right? Uh, that was my initial reaction. The thing is, they also looked at the sentiment of international coverage of, um, of COVID over the same time period in major media, and 50% of the stories were negative. 
So you see that American major media is dramatically more negative in its coverage of COVID. And the interesting thing, and you, again, you could say, because it's worse here in some ways, you know, we have a fraying of the social fabric, social justice, racism, all these things. Um, but <laughs> then they looked at um, the coverage of COVID in science journals over the same time period and found that that too was dramatically less negative than US major media coverage. So um, interestingly, what you see is that the volume and negativity of US major, major media coverage of COVID doesn't go down when the caseload went down. So in like May, June, when the caseload went down or when the vaccine started showing promise, the coverage was not calibrated to reality, right? So that's where we, we start to see the um, distortionary effects of this. Um, and it's not just that it polarizes us, it's that it makes us feel helpless, hopeless, cynical, and afraid. And when people are afraid, they make bad decisions, typically, I know I do. Um, so, this is a big piece of it, right? That I don't think we always talk about is the way that the media not just, you know, furthers polarization by sort of catering to outrage stories and indignation and, um, but also through the negativity. And interestingly, there was no partisan difference. So Fox News was just as negative as CNN and vice versa. Um, the Hill, which is a, 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 its own special case in some ways was the most negative. Politico was up there. The New York Times was very negative. And, and as someone who reads the New York Times every day, I can uh, just from a gut level confirm that that is correct. Um, so even when things are something positive, it's framed often, not always, as an adversarial us versus them, um, worst case scenario. So an example of this would be the coverage of the um, the children who were getting this sort of strange variant of COVID, which is a big deal, needs to be covered. But the volume of coverage, right, was dramatically different than the reality of the number of cases. So a lot of different forces here, but I just wanted to bring up the negativity. And because I don't want to repeat the error by being too negative myself today, um, I want to talk now just about um, what can be done to disrupt this cycle. Um, probably our biggest challenge, I think, as a country from a news media point of view is that we have no single news source that is trusted by both sides. And, and that's not true in every country, uh, as, as many of you know. Um, so interestingly though, our best hope may be, believe it or not, local TV news. Local TV news is the most trusted t news source. It's still not trusted by uh, a majority of, well, about half the people don't trust it still but it's way more trusted than the places I write for like the Atlantic and the Washington Post. And it is way more watched um, than, and, and consumed than those print outlets. It is still extremely influential. And this is the cool thing, local TV news benefits from having a ground truth. You know, because it's local, you may think that the media is biased and making things up and no one can be trusted, et cetera, et cetera. But you're aware of that stoplight that's not working or the bridge that collapsed because you see it with your eyes, right? So there's a kind of ground truth that you can't get as easily at the national level. Um, so the cool thing is, obviously local TV news has a, like a lot of problems and you know we all, many of us know what those are, so I'm not gonna dwell on those, but uh, I'm working on a story right now about some very, intriguing experiments and innovations that a bunch of different local TV news companies. So there's these big companies that own, you know, dozens and hundreds of these stations all over the country. And they've been really innovating in these very cool ways, a lot of which got accelerated during the pandemic for various reasons. But there was this big spike in um, audiences during the pandemic. People really tuned in, needed to know locally what was going on, how to keep their families safe, how to deal with their financial strain. So there was a huge opportunity. There continues to be an opportunity. And a bunch of different stations are doing things like listening to their audiences, which is very important for building trust and getting to a place where, where people from different political um, and racial backgrounds trust you. They're doing things like longer stories, which for TV news is like, uh, so like going from a minute to six minutes is I mean, mind blowing in TV news and they're doing that and it's working, which is very cool. Like in, if it's done well, what you see is audiences will watch it, they want it. 
They want less phony anchors. They want more local expertise. So these are encouraging things that I think, luckily, unlike, unfortunately, with newspapers, there's still enough money. These, these local TV news stations make a ton of money still. So there's enough money that they can take some risk and make mistakes and have a, a quick drop in ratings and build them back up. So um, for a lot of them, this is like this, this moment that won't last forever where they can make changes. Um, and, and many of them are, not all. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is just how what we know from the research that some of the people on this call have done, which is that um, people can be primed for polarization. They can also be primed for unity and they can also be primed for complexity. So um, I've written in the past about something called the Difficult Conversations Lab at um, Columbia University, where they have um, they pair up, Peter Coleman is the researcher there who runs that and they pair up people who uh, disagree strongly about hot top, hot button issues and they record their conversation and analyze it. And, uh, and one of the things they've learned that's really encouraging and particularly useful for journalists is that if people, before they sit down for that difficult conversation, if they read a news article about some other controversial topic, say gun control or abortion, and the news article is written in a, in a fairly nuanced way. So it's the same length, it's not super long, but it, instead of just having two sides, it has like four, um, which is actually much more accurate. Um, most people don't neatly sort, as we know, into two binary categories on complicated issues. So is sort of the same facts, but it, there's many points of view and it just acknowledges the complexity. And if people read that as opposed to traditional two-sided news story before they go in, they have much more dynamic, useful, satisfying conversations. They don't change their minds because that's not how humans work. They don't change their minds from talking to a stranger for 20 minutes, right? But they become more curious, which I think is my main job at this point. You know, as a journalist operating in a highly polarized conflict, all I can do, and it's a big thing, is to revive curiosity and try to provoke some sense that we don't know everything and that there's more to be learned. So in this difficult conversations lab, they did find that people were able to do that with priming people for complexity through journalism. So that is hopeful. Thank you.